I'm Bruce Worson, pastor of His Place Community Church. The following message came from a Sunday morning right here at His Place. Are you living up to the full extent of the agreement? Because Jesus first laid out his commanded arrangement with us at the Last Supper, saying, my command, you know, is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Okay, got it, Jesus, but how is that exactly? Well, you see, at just the right time, the right time, what was the right time? It says, it says, at just the right time, which was when we, ungodly sinners, as it'll go on to call us, were still powerless to help ourselves. At just that right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, right? But though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own, as in unique, all surpassing love for us. In this, while we were still sinners Christ died for us because of his own unique all surpassing love for weak ungodly sinners that should make your heart very happy that <laughs> he died at just the right time he died to show us his love and you go but why die Oh, because he is kind, I mean as in supremely kind, to the ungrateful and the wicked. So to keep up your end of the bargain, you must be merciful just as your father is merciful. Which means by showing the utmost kindness... In the face of ungratefulness and wickedness. And yet so often we think of other people's wickedness as an excuse or a pass to react with our own wickedness, right? It's like, oh, you just gave me permission and it's coming at you. But here's the thing. Whoever does not love like God, we've established that. Whoever does not love like God does not know God because God is love. God isn't defined by love. Love is defined by God. And to know him is to love him. So we know and rely on the love God has for us because God is love. Whoever lives in love then lives in God and God in him. That's how that works. So love your enemies. Do good to them without expecting to get anything back because you usually won't. Then you do that, then your reward will be great. And here it is. You will be children of the Most High. There's no greater reward. I loved last week, Noah showing us through the scriptures how Jesus emptied himself, became like us so that he could grow, so God could grow. I mean, it's just that's such a bizarre thought. So he could grow in wisdom and obedience By the things he suffered, he learned from what he suffered, the way we do. So this is a big, big, big question. How was he both fully God and fully man? Well, that's mostly a mystery. But it might help to picture a normal person like yourself, because he was like us, 
but with a conscience of perfect love. You know, the conscience of God. So just picture a normal human, but with a conscience inside that's perfect in love. Okay, you got that? So now, with that in mind, now I'm going to make up a story. This isn't from the Bible. But I'm picturing God as a boy growing and learning by what he's suffering with the perfect conscience. So just imagine young Jesus on the playground when a bully begins harassing a helpless child with little, if any, regard for his own safety. You know, that conscience, he's just, the boy with the conscience of God is immediately between them, right? His righteously angry but immature fist reflexively drawn back. But the closer he comes to striking the bully, our conscience, the further away he can sense that he's retreating from defeating their actual enemy, the adversary, who has tormented and tempted this playground bully into defying God's love. And it would tell him that any unrighteous reaction to righteous anger, this is where we get thrown off, because we, we're good at spotting the righteous anger, but then we kind of do the unrighteous reactions. But any unrighteous reaction to righteous anger will actually empower our adversary. But now in this story, because of his hesitation, he, he suddenly becomes the victim of the bully's abuse. And yet there would be something oddly satisfying in this suffering. He's accomplished his goal. His heart drove him to save the weak. And he has by taking his place. And now, even as he's suffering, his heart aches to save the even weaker child, the bully, from their shared enemy, the anti-father, we'll call him. But of course, on the cross, he crushes that bully of bullies. Because the real enemy, ours and God's, is only conquered by compassion. This isn't weakness, it's godliness. Because this enemy uses those around us to worm its way in us. Because the battleground is in our heart. And this nemesis of our soul has a name. Hate. A lot of hate going on in the world right now, isn't there? A lot of hate. And hate is deceptive. It disguises itself. And it hides in our heart. Not my words. Look at Proverbs 26. He who hates disguises it with his lips and lays up deceit within, within himself, in his heart. You know, the heart is deceitful above all. But though his hatred is covered by deceit within his heart, his wickedness will be revealed. But how's Jesus going to get those on the battleground to fully grasp what he has deeply sensed since the playground? There's just the one way. He's got to show them. He's got to show them. And we've talked about this verse a couple times in the last month there. So it, may, it hopefully will be familiar. But you remember how he said to the 12, have I not chosen you? The 12. All 12. Yet one of you is a devil. Right? And of course, Judas. Speaking of Judas, why did Jesus choose a devil to be a disciple. It's just one great reason. To show us. The full extent. Of his love. For us. If you host a dinner. And at that dinner. You discover that one of your guests. Has really severely betrayed you. But you, you continue. At that dinner. To. To. Uh, 
to, to treat them with the same sincere kindness as the rest of your guests. If that were to happen, it was, if it was humanly possible and you did that, that one guest unknowingly uh, receives the greatest extent of your love, right? Because it takes way more to love that one. <laughs> and so understand the only way the Lord could fully demonstrate the full extent of his love was to be fully rejected by all his guests, whether abandoned, denied, betrayed, persecuted, or executed. Back at the Last Supper, having loved his own, you know, the 11, he now showed them the full extent of his love, his own unique love, you know, by loving the one uh, who wasn't his own. You see, the devil had already prompted Judas to betray Jesus. But he began to wash his disciples' feet. And he said, you, don't, you do not realize now what I'm doing. For he knew, only he, well, and Judas, of course, <laughs> knew who was going to betray him. And so he's saying, I have set you an example. You know, when you really get whose feet I'm washing, then you do the same thing. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. You know, the 12, yet one of you is a devil. And look how he says, I know those I have chosen. You know, have I not chosen you and one's a devil? I know those I've chosen, but this, this what? This choice to love my enemy is to fulfill the scripture, which says, he who shares my bread, not just at the table eating bread. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, and he sent the 12 out to share that with others. This is one that shared the bread of life. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me, which is from Psalm 41. And talk about prophetic. Psalm 41 says in part, my enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? Yeah, he speaks falsely while his heart gathers slander. Then he goes out and spreads it abroad. All my enemies whisper together saying, oh, he will never get up from the place where he lies. Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. But you, O oh Lord, raise me up that I may repay them. How? With the full extent of God's love. I know that you who are love are pleased with me for my enemy in his hateful wickedness does not triumph over me in my loving kindness. So make a list of your enemies. You need an enemy list. Make a list of your enemies and realize this. Your enemy list is your prayer list. Say that with me. Your enemy list is your prayer list. They're one and the same if you're doing it right. If you're living up to your end of the agreement, how do we love them? By praying for them while they are still ungodly sinners. Do you know that it is on the very day that Jesus chose his 12 that he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you because if you if you love those like if you love only those who love you what reward will you get you know beyond easy the easy love of those you love are not even the tax collectors doing that Matthew but do you ever feel completely incapable of forgiving certain people you know the real hard ones 
Well, see, here's the problem. The trouble is, it is pert near impossible to love your enemy for no reason other than to love your enemy. That just don't get you very far. So you got to pay it forward for a friend. Which means seeing it through the eyes and the heart of your Savior, the friend of sinners. Uh, it's a lot like rescuing raccoons from a forest fire. Okay? You don't expect cooperation. <laughs> let alone appreciation. Why do you do it? Salvation is your motive. And rescue your reward. Why is it so easy to see with raccoons? <laughs> and you know going in that that thing's going to bite and claw you terribly unfairly. But you don't retaliate. In fact, it's a great example of where you forgive in real time. As it happens, you're forgiving and you're forgiving. As you're trying to find a way to convince those babies of your sincere love. And after the battle, you will victoriously display any wounds you received in the effort. Just like Jesus did. The only difference between bullies and raccoons is that, without a doubt, raccoons are way easier to love. Right? But that is only because you're not a raccoon. If you were a raccoon, those other raccoons would not be easy to love. If you love only those who love you, what reward will you get? Nothing surprising, nothing astonishing, nothing inspiring. So don't limit your reward by only loving a sure thing. Or you'll cheat yourself. Cheat yourself out of Jesus' selfless love working and growing in and through you. Loving our enemies always raises a lot of questions, right? Regarding forgiving versus excusing or downplaying or enabling or even encouraging sin. And when I forgive them, I get this question all the time. If I forgive them, do I have to trust them? Short answer, no. I can grasp loving the unlovable when we compare them to saving those cute but oblivious raccoons. But how do I forgive intentional, inexcusable violations against me? Okay, I'll admit, that's where the raccoon analogy really breaks down. We've all been there. You ever try really hard to forgive someone thought you had? You know, you said the words, you meant it. But then you encountered this person and you're just, through no fault of your own, you're just hit by this wave, big old wave of anger and anxiety and resentment. Well, so what do we do when our forgiveness don't take? You know, and especially with my opening, you, you might be thinking, if I'm not perfect, am I breaking the arrangement with Jesus? Yes, you are, absolutely. But don't panic. First, remember that right after the Last Supper, after he washed the feet, after he made the big speech, Peter went out and immediately cut off the ear of one of their bullies. And that's just kind of funny. It's a process. It takes time to learn. As we talked a couple weeks back, practice makes perfect. Little children, I love when they call us little children. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is perfectly righteous. Because, and we saw this one too, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And, and do you remember how we compared sin to your kid being sprayed by a skunk? Right? It doesn't make you love your child less. You just want to get the stink off of them as quickly and fully as possible. For everyone involved. There, no one likes it. Well, like all little children, growth is a process. And filth is a problem. You know? No sooner are we bathed and we are back 
traipsing in the mud and tracking it in the house. And this is what muddies up our daily walk with God. But when we confess our daily dirt and we allow Jesus to coat our grime with grace and wash us with his word, then we are renewed and refreshed and even inspired and empowered to grow in our skill to forgive all those who traipse through our lives and trespass against us. At the, uh, at the foot washing, Jesus said, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. And I'm just not sure whose feet he's referring to, his enemy's feet or his own feet. Because in the context, it sounds like you're talking about the feet he needs to wash. Because he says, wash each other's feet. Person has had a bath. You're saved? Great. Now wash their feet. It's all you need. You want to be complete to wash his feet. And you are clean, though not every one of you, Judas. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Your own, you know, the ones you like, and your Judas's. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you, the twelve, and yet one of you is the devil. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Because that's the agreement. That's the deal between us. And by this, all man will know that you are my disciples If you love one another as I have loved you. Even as he hung suffering at the hands of his mortal enemies. Jesus said, Father, we know this is such a famous statement. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Talk about love and forgiveness to the fullest. He set that bar as high as it could possibly go and then hung on it, all the while hanging on to his love for everyone. What an example. We've been so spectacularly forgiven, but we're so ridiculously unforgiving in light and in spite of it. But to be clear, and I want to be really clear, so hear this well. Forgiving does not mean dismissing or downplaying or excusing or rationalizing or trusting. It just means loving. Loving. Our Father doesn't do any of those other things with the ungrateful and the wicked, but He loves them. In fact, I love this verse. Many people put their trust in Jesus when they saw the powerful works he did, but Jesus did not trust them. Oh my goodness. These are the people he loved so much he died for, but he sure didn't trust them because he knew all men. He knew that all would quickly turn on or away from him. And yet he showed his love for them by forgiving them while dying for them because of them. So there's our example and expectation. You go, well, I can't get anywhere near that. You know, well, let's just add, that's okay, you can say that, but just add the word yet, okay? Yet, because that's the purpose of practice You shoot the ball till you learn to get it into the hoop. If you keep practicing, you will get the ball in the hoop eventually. (laughs) Same with that wave, right? Same with the wave. It's time to, see, here's the thing. Okay, you all know, because we all do this, when you got a grudge, you know how we rehearse a grudge over and over, and like you just replay the scene and replay what I would have said, should have said, could have said, and you just, and you just or just, you just stew it, and it just comes up, you see the person, and uh, right? That is practicing 
unrighteousness. But interestingly, it's the same way we release a grudge. So first, we forgive the person for the offense. That, that's something we, we actually kind of are good at. You know, we, we understand it's simple. I forgive them, Lord. But then when that wave hits you, we're all confused, right? Well, we forgive them after that for the painful memory over and over whenever it returns. That's a whole new thing. They caused that. That anxiety, you get hit by that wave, that person's actions caused that thing to happen. So you need to forgive them for that. And so you try that. You see them and those feelings are there or, or just comes to mind, something triggers. Forgive that person. Tell the Lord, Lord, I forgive them for that feeling. I forgive them for that memory. I forgive them for that pain. Don't practice the grudge. You practice that because that is practicing righteousness. But don't see this in any way as your generosity toward whoever the jerk was. Okay? Or it'll never take because they are not cute raccoons. Under your own power, it'll just peter out and you will end up lashing out in someone's ear. No. No, you got to see it as gratefulness toward him, your friend and forgiver and savior. Because forgiveness is a direct expression of our gratitude to God. Our debtors more than likely don't deserve our forgiveness. You can just say that. We, it's what it is. They don't deserve our forgiveness. But Jesus sure does. So we just got to love him more than we loathe them. Question is, are you grateful enough for him to love and forgive them to your fullest extent today? Let's pray that you are. <laughs> Let's pray that we do. Father God, we love you and worship you for your kindness to the ungrateful and wicked. Holy Spirit, inspire us and empower us to be merciful just as you are merciful. And Lord Jesus, we, we praise you and thank you for striking a fatal blow and crushing the bully of our soul. And in your name, everybody said, Amen. Well, thanks for listening in. Why don't you join us on a Sunday morning? If you'd like more information about the church, just point your browser to hisplacechurch.com. Until next time, may the Lord bless you, keep you, and make his face shine upon you.